Hey everybody, welcome back to the High Performance Zone. Today we got something special. We're talking aviation and leadership. And I have as my guest, Marine Colonel Doug Smash Yurovich. He was the first Marine that was a carrier air group commander. And that's a big deal. You know, I've been on those carriers and uh, to know the difference there. We talk aviation, we go behind the scenes, his ejection, how he survived. We talk about what's it like to be a test pilot. We get into a lot of the, the, the jargon of aviation. So if, if you are a, a leadership expert or someone who's trying to grow your leadership, uh, Smash and I talk about success is learning from your failures and uh, and being a sphere of influence. So stand by. This is an aviation talk. Glad to be here. Gucci, ready? Hit it. Hey, everybody. Welcome back. I have a rare privilege to uh, be with Colonel Doug Smash Yurovich, uh, who was the first Marine colonel of an air wing, a carrier air group air wing. And uh, that's something I want to unpack. But First off, uh, Smash Gucci here. Glad to have you. Well, pleasure to meet you, and I appreciate um, getting invited on. I think maybe some people know how I got here, but it was because you had met my daughter and and spoke at her corporation. So again, real proud of Deanna and what she does. Yeah, you know, we had at, at Alarm.com. She she's doing an amazing job, and uh, in our briefing calls, because just like we did in the, in the fleet, uh, we would do have briefs and debriefs, right? And and she goes, my dad, I'm so proud of my dad. You know, and we talked about how she grew up all over uh, the U.S. And, uh, and, and I said, you know, tell me more about your dad. And when I found out your career, I said, I got to have Smash on this podcast. Um, first off, because I don't know if you knew this, I was an exchange pilot with the Marines at BMF AT 101 for one year. Yeah, I read and, that in your book. I helped stand up 101 and uh, when it moved from Yuma to um what was it it was uh, el toro at the time toro. and then went to miramar because i was up at bfa uh 125 as a hardcore lamoron oh you were yeah 1986 yeah. to 89 wow we were there together i was uh, i was an a7 guy i was part of va 22, 22 the fighting yeah. redcocks uh in 86 through 88 on the enterprise and i remember i so much wanted to be a 125 though i mean who wants to be an a7 guy when you can be an f18 guy right? yeah i and, saw that i saw that in your book i know i know cap but or and I, um you know mccabe from the building so there's some interesting names in there that i do know uh i'll tell you but or was still you know he was my rag co uh, in the a7s and before he became a cag like yourself uh, and I just, I still have such deep respect. We were in, in, in QB Point. You remember the, uh, the Oak Club I did. there? I did two, uh, two tours in QB and, one, and Phantoms. And in fact, if you go to the Pensacola, there's yeah. two tables and four plaques with my name on it. And I still have my QB Point dice downstairs. So <laughs> we, we should break those out for today. But yeah. uh, this is, oh. this is just a, a sure pleasure, a real joy. Uh, what I want to just do, dive in real quick, Smash, is, you know, you were, for, for our audience, uh, the first Marine Carrier Group Commander. When I read that, I, I'd like to know how that happened, right? Because that's, that's not normal, right? How did you become a CAG as a Marine CO fighter pilot? Well, you got to kind of go back to uh, an initiative called Tech Air Integration that I was the lead in from the Marine side of the Pentagon. Okay. And um, I was working, uh, I was in APP and um, I was working with the N78 crowd, right? So, you know, McGinn and McCabe were up there and uh, it, it, uh, there's about 18 hours of oral history in Quantico, but the long and the short of it was that the Navy wanted a Marine F-18 squadron in every air wing. Yep. They didn't really want that. Um, I think in essence, they wanted 250 Marines on the ship with, that came with the, with the uh, squadron, right? So you got 10 air wings, right? Um, but we had Ds, we had As, we had Cs, you got an AIMD issue. You're not taking all that out there. But anyway, as a subsequent effort, and there's an enigma out there that I couldn't, I can't remember his name, because he was a CO 122. And when they did this TAC air integration, there was a discussion that, well, we're going to swap commanders. 
we'll give you guys a mag CO maybe, and we'll give you a carrier CO, Marine Corps. Uh, I'm sorry, CAG. Um, but to look at that board was done on purpose inside of the Marine Corps with an admiral representation on the board in Quantico on the 2nd of December, 2002. Uh, I won't go into the names, but um, you know, I had also been the chief staff officer carrier Air Wing one on board the, the um, America, the last deployment there, because I was pretty much long in the tooth XO. And uh, Boomer Stufflebeaven was the DCAG at the time and Randy oh, yeah. Rock was CAG. And I think Benny Suggs was the American uh, CO. And when I was a chief staff officer and I was sitting in C at Catsy at night in the big colonel's captain's chair, because um, Randy Robb let me do that. And um, Benny once said, you know, I could be looking at the Marine, first Marine Corps CAG. And I said, you know, sir, I, I don't think that happened. But so fast <laughs> forward, now I'm the CO 251 in Buford. I'm on the Kennedy. Okay. And Pat Walsh is my CAG. Uh, oh, was Sponge your CAG? Uh, the finest naval officer, I, naval officer. You, you yeah. name the service uh, that I ever worked for. And, um, you know, he was, um, you know, and I had about three years, I wasn't an 05 as long, but at time in service, I was, you know, senior guy there. But uh, we had 82 and 86 and brought them into Buford in 2000. So I went to the Army War College, went in the building, APP, Work Attack Air Integration, they had that board, and the funny thing is, then I went to J8, and I was doing uh, studies analysis and gaming division, and I was doing uh, dominant, I was the last Jewick elite as dominant maneuver, and then I went to studies analysis and gaming division, and so they put a Navy captain in charge of MAG-12 in Iwakuni. Um, came in, he was gone before I even got near being the DK, because I deployed as a DK. Yep. But, but on the other hand, one of the guarded secrets that a lot of people didn't know when I was working in the J-8, I saw that I was slated for CAG-90 was supposed to be a cadre air wing because they were going to transition 46 and four, 146 and 147 yep. to joint strike fighters. Uh, but with the ops tempo, they couldn't do that. Uh, the JSF, you know, as typical new airplanes have a tendency to do, not right on time. And then they kept it on the uh, Vincent and they extended the Vincent before they brought it around to recoil the reactor. So um, it was a great tactical opportunity. It always is sailors. I got 15 years in, you know, between Pensacola, uh, Lamore, Pax River, um, two tours in Air Wing 1, then an Air Wing 9 DCAG tour. You know, I had uh, two years as a DCAG and six months roughly as a chief staff officer. I had two and a half years on air wing staffs. Wow. And, wow. Um, hey, Smash. So there you, there were about you? three people. There were about three people that were qualified that were briefed at the board. And, and I got picked. That's amazing, though. I mean, I, I, I'm so proud of that uh, because I remember, you know, my time frame, you know, the Marines, we would go through, you know, 125 training and uh, and you get carrier qualified, but not all all the squadrons necessarily deployed, right? And they would they would just send one squadron. So in your in your air wing, did you have any marine squadrons as part of the air wing? How was the air wing made up? In CAG nine? Yeah. Yeah, we had the snakes. Oh, Here's you did. Three. Okay. Now that in in the first air wing. One deployment, we had 251 and we had VMAQ2. Oh, you did? The A6Bs out of Cherry Point. Yeah. Um, when I was a squadron CO, 251 was the only one in Air Wing 1. And then as the DCAG deploying on the Carl Vincent, we had 323 out of uh, then Maryland. Uh, okay. Hey, give me a story on Sponge. I know you told me that he was the finest naval officer you ever worked for, which is an amazing statement because of the people you did get to work for. Uh, you know, his background with, with myself was he was a Blue Angel uh, and 
Okay. He was on the team that um, right before that selected me. And, and I got to spend some quality time with him, not in a professional way, you know, just uh, uh, and when he applied for the White House fellowship. In fact, he uh, I'll never forget because I, I wanted to apply for it. I didn't get it. He did, of course. Uh, but he produced a binder that was the most impressive binder. And he just did it for for himself and then and shared it with everybody. This is what you need to do if you want to do that. But what's what's a story, a sponge story that you remember? Well, he, you know, we had some personnel issues and he always gave me credit of kind of being out ahead of him. But um, I used to, he, he amazed me at the retention of facts and talking at change of commands or all hands. You know, I don't think you see many kegs talking about the Battle of Agincourt, you know, and the lessons <sighs> were, you know, things like that. So, um, you know, I spent a lot of time listening to him more than talking with him. And then when he was on the BRAC, um, he was in the Pentagon and I was, um, I just got selected, but we we're waiting. You know, there, there was a big time, there was a lot of issues, but that being said, I went to, I had office calls in the Pentagon after I had left. I was going to Oceana to get called. So I, I had flown the F-18, A, B, C, D, and E, and F when it was all said and done. Wow. You know, so I went into his office and the interesting thing was we got to talk and he goes, Smash, they didn't put you into this position to not select you for the next rank. And I said, well, sir, you got to understand the Marine Corps is ground combat centric and the farther you would get away from the mainstream, you know, but it's still kind of like being an astronaut, right? I was a nine, yeah. uh, 91 and 93 uh, pick for the Marine Corps, but they'll never tell you why. And, you know, in 92, the ejection happens, so you're damaged goods to begin with. But um, why do you get non-selected for 07 when everybody's competitive? They're never going to tell you either. You know, I joined the Marine Corps in 75 and, you know, there was that old poster, right? We don't promise you a rose garden. So I knew there was never any promises. <laughs> What uh, what got you into the Marines? What was it in your childhood uh, that said I want to I want to be a Marine? Well, I had two uncles that were Marines, kind of, um, but that was that was younger. I think it was a challenge. I think if I'd read your leaf through your book and read most of it, and, you know, the whole concept of what you did and how you wanted to do it. For me, it was, you know, as a left-handed kid growing up with Black Franciscans in a Catholic school, to me, it was always meeting the challenge. So to me, the Marine Corps posed the challenge. Yeah. Um, the story about that is in USA hometown, my mom worked at McDonald's part-time from 71 to 2000. And so she knew all the Marines and the recruiters and all that. And I had met a guy we went to Admiral King High School. You know Admiral King, right? So of course. Yeah, he was he he was born in Lorain, Ohio. And um, he told me about the platoon leaders class. So I walked into downtown Lorain, Ohio to talk to the sergeant. I said, Hey, I want to go into Marine Corps, but I want to talk to an officer selection officer. And he knew my mom, and but you know, this is 1975. I got long blonde hair, and I could have sent you the football <laughs> picture, but you could just laugh. And um, I didn't know these guys came out of the woodwork and there's this guy with seven stripes and a star in the middle of it. And it's the region, the district sergeant major, Wow, you know, and he doesn't know I'm already going to Ohio state. You know, he doesn't know my history. So, um, I was always told if you go talk to a Marine recruiter, you better take a priest and a lawyer. So, um, <laughs> but I went in there knowing what I wanted. And so we bantered a little bit and I had no idea who this guy was and the rest of them. So I finally said, uh, he goes, well, why don't you just join, go to Paris Island and Marine Corps. Let's see if you got what it takes to be a Marine. You know, how do you even know your uh, college material? And, you know, I, you know, here I am thinking about my two uncles and the priest and the attorney. And I just looked at him and, you know, years later, I went, man. But I said, Sarge, if I'm going in the Marine Corps, I'm going in with bars on my shoulders, not uh, stripes on my arms. And he looked at the sergeant, he goes, he's cocky enough to be a Marine, send him to Cleveland. And that's <laughs> so. I have 20 wow. December 1975. I'm running a mile on East 9th of Euclid, right down by downtown, and it's freezing. And um, did my inventory and raised my right hand, and there I was. Wow. Well, wow. you know, so like, then you, you know, went to the program. 
Pardon? Yeah, PLC. And like your program, I mean, it's a series of meeting the objectives and that opens more opportunities, right? So, I mean, I graduated with two degrees in four years as an undergraduate at Ohio State and one of them was mathematics. So that's now a requirement to go to test pop school. You're growing up in Ohio and over the years I've met John Glenn, I, I met um, Neil Armstrong, I sent you that picture, you know, and there's a space yeah. issue and all that now, but you got to get through the basics. You got to get through OCS. You got to get to the base tool. You got to get to Pensacola. Then you got to get jets kind of, you know, when you go, it's just like you, you want to be a blue yeah. angel. You want to fly hornets. You go to the seven. I mean, in my first life, I was a Harrier pilot. Why oh, were you really? I wanted, I wanted to be a Harrier pilot coming out of Beaver. Nice. So you were in Bevo. What time frame were you in Bevo? 1981. Really? Yeah. So I'm about three years behind you. I, I finished the Beville in 84. Um, and so you you chose Harriers first. Did you is that what you think? Yeah, I did. I, you know, the senior Marine there who's still been a mentor to me for, for a long time. And he's got a name on a table at, at uh, Pensacola 2 out of QB. Um, he pinned my wings on me. And um, I, they kept pushing me in. I mean, I went through, I started flying in February of 81 and I got my wings in September of 81 through A4s. Wow. In A4s. I had a boat in April and a boat in September. That's fast. It took me, you know, I think almost two years, a year and a half. The, the pipeline slowed down. It so you were, you were pumped. Wow. That's amazing. Hey, give me a, I will be unpacking this, but I just want to go early on to what were some of the most interesting airplanes you fly, you flew, you know, it's the classic question. Um, yeah. But what is it that, that you look back on and you say, I really enjoyed that airplane? Well, I would, my first airplane I ever flew was a T-28. And to be honest yeah. with you, it kicked my butt, the BT-6, and I was pretty happy not to be flying that anymore, but because uh, if it wasn't for Lieutenant Commander Chris, my primary down there in VT6, who was a reservist and sang in the Pensacola Opera, I probably wouldn't have got jets. So I still wow. am thankful to that man to this day. But yeah. um, I've had a lot of, I've flown over 65 different airplanes, give or take. And, you know, yeah. like I said, I've flown e A, B, C, D, E, and F. Yeah. Um, my earliest was a pre-lot four, and I don't remember my E and F out of the Black Knights, but um, um, but I did get to fly P-51 Mustang at PAX, the Crazy yep. Horns. That was good. My final eval was done in Reno Stead. I flew the MiG-15 oh. out there, you know, so that was yeah, the, the contract with that graduating from test pilot school is, you know, you got... Uh, Four flights or six hours, whichever comes first, and then you got two weeks to do your report. So I had bid the MiG-15 um, for a variety of reasons, but I went through Top Gun in the F-4S. Uh, so that was, okay. uh, yeah, that was 1985, you know, and then the movie came out in 86, and we were all bar singers by accident, so. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy i remember that that wednesday night at the club right Miramar. Uh, yeah and then hit uh hit per hit uh, san diego mcrd on friday if you wanted to go play there. <laughs> you're right hey what um how many hours did you finally get in the hornet uh 2500 wow okay good what uh you know as, as we're thinking about because most people on this don't necessarily know all the military jargon that that we we've been throwing out here you've had such an amazing career not just as a commanding officer right um what were some of your major takeaways from your career as, as a marine oh you know um i'll go back to the discussion on meeting the challenge right um, I always used to tell my Marines uh, from the time I was a division officer at Pax River, sailors and Marines is, you know, you have uh, expectations of your commanders and I have expectations of you as Marines and sailors. And um, chances are you won't tell me that I'm not meeting your expectation, but I go to Great Lakes to do that. To me, the simplest return on your time and investment 
in aviation for a leader, let's go to fog walk. Not the directed fog walk on the ship, back in Lemoore, back in Beaufort, go to fog walk, be out there. Um, you know, and I think Marine leadership at times can be as simple as the CO eats last, but he gets the first uh, vaccination, right? Mm -hmm. uh, lead by example and you take care of your people. I think that goes a long way to every, you know, a lot of things, but um, it, it, that sounds very simplistic, but you and I both know it's not, yeah. you know, and um, the, the funny thing, when I was going through 106 or I would go into, I could clear out a ready room as an 06 in five minutes. I'd, I'd hit my clock. I'd walk in, get a cup of coffee, just sit down, you know, and all the lieutenants, you know, in either a 125 or 101 or, you know, 106 there. And yeah. next thing you know, I'm looking around and I looked at the ODO and I go, didn't take me long, did it? <laughs> but, you know, you get filtered information as you get more senior, right? We all understand that. But I think if you, you know, two things that always took me on leadership training was, and then part of my PhD, the doctorate in business and technology is a subset of full leadership, right? Um, so I'm going to kill this. And um, I think if you're honest with yourself, you know, um, um, know yourself and seek self-improvement and then, um, you know, you really do have to take care of your people um, because if you think you know it all and you got it all right, then then you don't. Yeah. So I think the takeaway is what I tried to do, you know, you're not going to change the world. I mean, the young Lieutenant Colonel who just decided to do what he did had a flash in the pan impact, but you're not going to change those organizations. But what you do have as a leader, a commander, whether you're the guy that's got the flag, the division leader, the section leader, the division officer, um, you do have a sphere of influence. And People, people hear what you say, but they watch what you do, and that's yeah. more important, right? So, yeah. I mean, I'd go to Fod Walk, and everybody would look at me and go, well, why is the colonel out here? Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I love that. that. Yeah, so I, they, want to be, they want to know that you're paying attention. When I first got in as a CEO of uh, 251, they had come off a deployment, the one I missed. I think it was the Eisenhower, but it might, I could be wrong. So we ran a PFT, right? And you look like you haven't uh, missed a whole lot of gym time yourself. So, um, you know, I'm, this is, this is 99, 98, fall of 98. And um, so I'm 41. Am I doing my math right? Yeah. So you go off, we do our 20 pull-ups and 100 sit-ups or crunches, you know, and then we take off on the three-mile run. Back then, you know, I mean, the ejections beat me up a little bit, you know, but I was running about 23-minute three, three, three-mile run, okay? okay? You know, for, for the old guy, you know, I'm coming in at a, at a one for the Marine Corps, but I'm, I'm watching kids come back and anyway... I asked the Sergeant Major, I said, Sergeant Major, I'd like to see every teenager that finished behind me in the run. Oh. He goes, sir, you want office hours? I go, no, I just want to talk to them. I want to see their SRBs and I want to talk to them. <laughs> you know, in, in the Marine Corps, if you're going to come to a gun squadron, you've gone to Paris Island. And then if you test out, you're going to go to the Navy, to A school, and you're going to learn how to do that stuff. And then you're going to show up in Buford and swing with the wing. So it took about six of these guys to finally get it out, what I was doing. But with the, S, with the uh, SRBs, I would sit, offer them, bring them up to my office, have to sit on the couch. I'd kind of move around my desk, you know, and not be this commanding officer. And I knew where they were from. And I said, so how's things in a barracks? Because my first tour there was a barracks officer. And chow, right? And um, oh, good, sir. Oh, good, sir. You know, this, this, and this. And I said, so let me ask you a question. I said, um, why do I have scars older than you are that finished that run faster than you did? 
And they looked at me like, sir. And I said, come on, a 19 year old Marine and you're coming in at 30 minutes. So I went through 13 of them. And then the next PFT before we, I think it was after Fallon, the Irwin did at Fallon, those guys just held in a pack in about the second mile, maybe two and a half, they just come by me. Hey, Skipper. Hey, Skipper. And I said, you know, it's kind of like what reminds me of uh, the Clint Eastwood, you know, Heartbreak Ridge, right? They take off running and here he comes, right? So don't let me catch you in that last three quarters of a mile. <laughs> so they just want to know that you're paying attention to them and yeah. that you have their best uh, interest at heart. And I would, um, I think, again, they, they hear you. They hear you, but they see what you do, and that's more important. Yeah, yeah. Talk about talk to me about the ejection. What um, what was you know uh, around that, and how did uh, what did you learn from that? Well, it's, that's what we talk about unpacking things. My goodness, dude. So um, so back in Beeville, there were two instructors who had a big impact on me. One of them was Smoke Burgess. He pinned my wings on me. He retired as a colonel. Uh, he's now retired. He was a 46 pilot in Vietnam, year group 66. So he'll never tell you this. Silver Star, DFC, yada, yada, yada. The other guy who's in one of the pictures is a guy named uh, Wizard Pennington. Now, you know, if you're prematurely gray in the service, you're either going to be Gandalf or Wizard. So this was Wizard. Um, Wizard was the XO of the Marine Air Detachment at the time. Now, fast forward 11 years, right? So he was in the back seat of the horn and I was in the front seat. We were chasing, you might know him, Joe Bouchard. Joe was a student of mine in Lemoore. He was an, he's a two-star admiral now, I think, unless he retired. And he was doing some Kuwaiti foreign military sales. We just kept hearing. In fact, the airplane that we were flying was getting supposedly groomed to uh to do spin testing because i was on the spin test team for hornets which was the handoff spins you know yeah well what we found was everybody who departed the airplane and we did all that in man flight simulator pax river you know would have some type of stress related um pressure on the flight controls right more times than not it was their feet so if you stall and yaw an airplane where are you going right so they decided to go. So we we were planning that test plan. Well, <clears throat> this airplane had a transient, and, and anyway, I you know I have to shoot my my uh, watch because I think my airplanes are gone. But um, we came to we're going to take an arrestment at PAX. Uh, wizard in the back said he, we declared an emergency, and I went to take a trap and. The airplane kicks off and the rudders turn off. Now there's a bunch of things that happen in this, but I get back airborne and the brief had been, this goes into the lessons learned, right? The brief had been, cause he was my XO, he was my instructor, but he only had a hundred hours of the Hornet, but he also was a test pilot for F-16N for, you, for the, you know, adversary. So he had a lot of electric jet time. Plus he was a department head at Pax River and strike. So anyway, we miss, we can't, we can't arrest. I get to about a hundred feet and I get airborne again. Um, tower, salty dog, one, one, three, one, or 101, go ahead. I'd never hear them. I'd reset the flight controls. I was locked and um, the airplane departs and goes knife edge. Wizard punches us out. The canopy goes, wizard leaves inverted at 480 feet. And I leave at 380, get shot in the ground. Um, nice fast ride and I let you know I left a hell of a divot so uh I got a few new body parts for that and one of the the more entertaining stories of that and I think it was either in the daycare because Deanna was this was uh February, this was uh, one October 1992 so Deanna born in May of 89 99 you know she's got what two two and a half years three and a half so her comment in some discussion Donna tells me about was somebody asked, hey, did you see what happened at the air station? And they, she goes, she just, you know how she is. She's just, um, yeah, that was my daddy. His airplane turned upside down and he fell out. Um, 
so I was beat up pretty bad. There's another whole lot of other stories, but um, you still there? Yeah, you were fading. I saw the Blue Angels. And, uh, no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm here. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, you invert, you punched out inverted at 380 feet. Did the seat actually um, start to upright you or not? Just I was sure they, according to the MIR, which I have a hard copy still, I got about 80% of the shoe. So Whoa. this is this ball of mass coming down. Wow. And uh, what, um, what were the injuries? So, I mean, how'd you survive that? Number one. Well, the, the guy in uh, Bethesda who put me back together said, they, they gave me credit for upper body strength, but what ends up happening is I hit the thing and, and probably, I don't know, I, I, didn't, I didn't skip because I saw the divot. I broke my leg. Um, I got a plate and eight screws to this day in my leg. Cracked six discs. I uh, dislocated my left rib cage, which I didn't know for 10 years. I just knew it was painful and they couldn't figure it out and rip my chin off because while the mask stayed on, um, the amplifier took everything off, right? So if you think about, and you've been in the Hornet, think about where the FCS reset button is. So I'm locked in because we were going to take an arrest one. Yeah. And I reached down and went to make sure I got it and it reset for a potato. And when I got back up, we departed. Now, there are three things wrong with the airplane. I won't go into it because you asked me about lessons learned. One, um, I give aeronautical decision making lectures now as a flight instructor and a chief test pilot and a safety director. Um, the MIR hit me on two things. On a more prudent aviator might not have taken the airplane that day, although we did everything in accordance with NATOPS. And I didn't get in the correct position to eject. That's why I sustained my injury. Okay. I'll take those hits. You know, it's the whole get judged by a few instead of carried by six. Um, yeah. If it wasn't for Wizard, I'd be dead. So um, that's one of one of six lies. But um, the discussion in the brief we adhered to. You know, it's the same thing you were talking about. And you go along the brief. You got your plan, and the brief was we briefed it the night before and it canceled. We briefed it again in the morning. I was in the front seat, he was in the back, but he had been an instructor of mine. He was also my XO and he was also a Lieutenant Colonel and I was a major. Um, I was like, wizard, if you don't like what's happening, get us out, okay? Cause he was in dual jet. Um, I had a thousand hours in the airplane and handled the emergency. Although I probably wouldn't have declared an emergency initially, he recommended it. And, you know, as a 05 to 04, you know, I just declared an emergency. I have an MIR um, CD that they did in the manned flight simulator, Pax River, that takes the audio and puts it together. And for 10 years, I couldn't. But now I teach with it. So we stayed with our plan as the brief. Otherwise, I'd be dead. Um, in fact, here's the ejection handle I never pulled with my dog tags. So you fly single seat airplanes and you get out of an airplane and you didn't pull the handle. I, I would have thought that I compartmentalized from that brief, but you know, I kind of rationalized that for, and I had some rehab time. I did fly. I took a PFT in February and then started flying again at PAX in, um, I want to say my logbook would say March, but um, so stay with your brief. Okay. Especially in emergency. Um, I probably could have done better getting more altitude, okay, because I didn't think that thing was going to go to hell in a handbasket as fast as it did, which I can go through and you probably can too. I got 33 deployments to Fallon, and I will tell you there's a chocolate mess out, a lot of chocolate messes out there. 122 had a day when I was out there in Phantoms, um, you know, so uh, again, stay with your brief, stay with your plan, execute. Um, if you go wave off, get altitude, right? Um, I was 500 feet. I probably shouldn't have been doing what I was doing. I could have got to six or 700 feet. But for years, I had the dream that I was, because that airplane was 15 degrees nose down. It was going in. Yeah. And um, if I had more altitude, I don't think we at least got shoes. Yeah, Wizard didn't get hurt. He got he hit straight up and down on his heels and pancake backwards. 
So, um, and the other thing is, if, if you're doing what's right, then you could stand the screw. Okay. Yeah. Because um, I talked to pilot, I talked to general aviation pilots, you know, and we do this at the school. Show of hands, how many people have declared an emergency? And the only guys who have are military pilots, right? Because GA doesn't want to do that. The, the FAA, the paperwork, I don't know, but there's a whole there's a whole issue that goes with that. So I think you've seen it too. You, Naval aviation itself and, and all of fighter aviation for the most part, um, a lot of type A personalities. And yeah. type A personalities fail. Sometimes they don't know how to recover. All right. Um, there was just the other day, yesterday or the day before on LinkedIn, they, it was funny. It was just one of the jokes. And there's a picture of Robin Olds in his fan, right? With that bush hat and that big old mustache. And the question was, you know, how long does it take to, how long does it take for an average person to become a pilot, fighter pilot? And the answer is <laughs> average people don't become fighter pilots. <laughs> um, but we try to teach the young aviators to be, you know, long life pilots. And so I wrestled with that for a while. I mean, I really did, but the lessons learned were brief, stick to your brief, execute. Um, you're gonna have to deal with some scrutiny, all right? If you're doing what's right, you can weather the storm, you know, and you gotta be able to, as a type A with a little backbone, Lace up, lace them up tight because you know people are looking at you and make your recovery. And uh, I was a community leper for one October to about 10 to 15 November because the OEM, uh, you know, that airplane uh, was telling everybody that, you know, they, they knew what was wrong with it, told the Navy, and they still flew it, which was total horseshit. So, uh, <laughs> You know, the, what I didn't know was the airplane augers in and kills a lady in a white pickup truck on an access road. Now, I don't find out about that till Sunday. Now, this is a Thursday. Sunday, I'm at and Bethesda. They finally put me back together and they tell me that. My dad was there and, you know, everybody else. Um, and I said, you know, what bothers me about that is it doesn't bother me. You know, so... Um, I never met the lady. There's another story years later, but you know, it's funny with Deanna having two kids now. I get Sesame Street over 60, where back <laughs> then Sesame Street over 30, right? And I was up real early. And when I was 15, I had knee surgery and did the same thing. I was playing ball and I got up, cleaned myself off the whole bit. And my grandmother comes in and she's screaming, he's not there while well, I was at the restroom. So from Thursday, I'm in an ambulance. I go up there. I get Ross around. Um, it packs. I mean, at Bethesda. And about two in the morning, Sunday morning, I'm up. But I still got burrs in my butt, you know, from packs. And my legs all finally fixed. But the rest of me just feels like 10 miles of beat up road. And I'm black and blue from my nose to my navel. So I get up, the guy next to me is, I don't know if he's making the night because he sounds terrible. So I just kind of hobble over, get in the shower, sit there and get all cleaned up. You know, and I shaved what I could because I couldn't touch anything about here because it, it was all just road rash, right? So the nurse comes in in the morning about eight o'clock, they change shifts. He goes, it was major, it's time to clean you up. And she looks, and goes, she goes, did you take a shower? I go, yeah. But this morning and she started yelling at me i said what are you gonna do you know you, they yelled at me when i was 15 now here i am in 92 you know you're yelling at me when i'm 35 i've been through this before and i just almost got killed in an airplane accident so knock yourself out you know <laughs> so then uh, don had gotten up there my mom and dad and, and deanna ran in like daddy daddy and she saw just how much of a mess i was she ran out crying so oh uh -huh. Well, but airborne, <laughs> airborne wise, the real key is much like we grew up, right? You you plan, you brief, you execute, you debrief. And the pieces of the debrief, from my point of view, teaching were stay with your plan. If you go wave off, get altitude. And I wrestled with the fact teaching single um, seat pilots that you have to have an idea what your dis ejection criteria yeah. needs to be. Anybody? 
you're never going to go off the runway in Fallon for the most part and not get out of the airplane because you have to or you'll be out of the ejection area, which I was. You know, so I was really lucky. Um, if you pull out a Hornet and go through that, depending on whether you got one of these like number two little, little pencils or a big fat one, you might be in, on, or out of the envelope. Chances Ooh. are you're out of the envelope. Yeah. What an amazing experience there. What um, you know, it's going through my mind is how you use those lessons as a commander later, right? And, uh, um, you know, learning from those things, uh, unbelievable. But let me ask a question because I was always interested in the spin test. You did the spin test for the Hornet. I, it, it, you know, there were, four you of us, there, were, there were four of us on that team. Um, two Marines, we were backseat guys because we had been instructors. Uh, okay. The Canadian, Chris Hadfield, um, who oh, I yeah. would probably say he's the finest test pilot I ever flew with. Wow. And um, uh, I'm going to forget his name now. Uh, a, 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 a Navy Lieutenant Commander um, who was in Lemoore. Um, but yeah, that's, we did that. And, you know, you've you got all the pushback from Nav Air, right? You guys are nuts, you know, blah, 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 blah. But, um, cause you had a seven guys and you had phantom guys, you know, guys who would, you know, deal with all that. And what they didn't know was, as like I said, every, anytime an F-18 crashed, pilot live or not, we went into the man flight simulator packs and went through that. And what you're seeing, there were a couple of high speed departures of Fallon on bug outs, right? Mm -hmm. Looking over. And um, what we were seeing in the data was someone always had some pressure on one of their feet, right? A person under stress and what we've done, consider yourself as a solo or the slot or where does your stress go to? Chances are it goes to an appendage. You know, either you're squeezing the black out of the stick or you yep. just bent the throttles because you've got that. More times than not, though, people translate it to their feet. So wow. put, your, put yourself in a stressful departure situation and you think you got your feet on the floor, but you don't. Yeah. So Interesting. It, it um, exacerbates that. But by the, why was Chris Hatfield, you said the finest test pilot you ever flew with how do you give a, a person that criteria what was it well i've i trained a lot of them yeah and weapons up and you know that costs a lot of money if you couldn't get me data you'd get two shots and i wouldn't bring you back which caused chip dutter or the director to call me in at times and um, he could set a data point as well as anybody as quick as anybody and you know, there's no doubt in my mind of why he was an astronaut for just at least the crowd there at Pax River didn't know he could sing back then, you know. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, From space, too. Yeah. I mean, how cool what we were trying to do is establish initial conditions and dictate uh -huh. departure characteristics and see if we could. Well, what, you know, what I learned in that thing, first off, is never take your ink pens in, in your flight suit. Because we took three and a half lateral G's one time, and my my uh, arms had hit the canopy. I was locked in tight, and we got bam bam. Then I broke two pens, and I got black and blue marks here, and said, "Okay, no more of that." But um, yeah. Slammy what? Prater. I want to think. I want to say it was Slammy Prater. I oh, forget. okay. Yeah, I remember that name. Hey, what? Why was the Hornet so unpredictable? In departures, you know, it, it, uh, it, it at least it was taught to me to be, you know, very sensitive, aware of don't depart this airplane, which obviously limits your dogfighting. You know how how close to the edge you're going to get. Uh, why was it was it really unpredictable if you departed? No, I don't. I don't think it was. I used to do this down at Beaufort too. We'd have guys depart the airplane, and they'd show the HUD tape, and they were like, you know, the Hornets. I go, look what you're doing. You know, you yeah. bring it up and you get to the top. Remember, there was that almost 90 degrees over the top where you didn't want to unload. You had to keep the nose moving. Yeah. yeah. I thought that the D was just a chocolate mess. And I was on the F-18D Hornet introduction team. That's really what got me to the board to be a hardcore. 
And oh, by the way, I didn't go to CQ after I completed there and just went to uh, went to be an IP. Go back to your point about not. I didn't go to I didn't go to the boat in this world until again until I was a major at two fifty one on a Lincoln. And, really? Yeah, and um, you used to have all the parties out in the more uh, shifty. Yeah. Shifties, shifties, fifties. Shifty was the big XO. So he's like, Major, what are you doing on my boat? I said, Shifty, how are you doing, sir? So I was the XO 251. And I'm, you know, I'm coming back to play. So as a major, lieutenant colonel, and a colonel, that I get back in the boat world after, you know, Beagle. So, you know, and I, yeah, I won't go there. Uh, the Lincoln had, you know, an incident that, but yeah. So, you know, yeah, but that's why they did. They wanted to see because they they were redoing the software for spin to part. Remember, it's electronic flight controls. You know, the F-16, same thing, right? Those are those are really unstable designs unless you have, you know, you you become that voting member as the pilot, right? Um, yeah, so we we had a lot of issues, not so much with what we were doing in the test because but it was the legacy of, and, and you you got some of this in the A7 mafia if you went through 122, right? We had some of that as we brought people together, like uh, Buttonieri worked up there. You know, Shortney was an instructor sure. up there. Um, yeah. In fact, him and I flew the first 3D lat sortie together. And then I became the lat manager, right? Oh, you did? Yeah, and I went over and taught uh, lat wing pack um, the A7 guys, and they were, in, and it was an A7 program. But yeah. You got, I was a lad eye in the Phantom. That was my first really eye in 1984. So you go over there and talk to those guys, and like, you know, Captain, this doesn't work. I go, it's your program. It came from the Guard of Tucson. It's an A7 program. So, you know, it's the institutional friction. You see that when you're talking to people, right? Look, they yeah. bring you in to do what you do, but it's the institutional friction that, you know, you don't want to change. So we had the A7 guys, we had the Phantom guys, you guys got to be crazy letting everything go and just go for the ride. Yeah, but, you know, in essence, it was a better way to do business um, because we were our own problems when we departed airplanes. Did you ever get a chance, you flew the MiG-15, you know, I, I'm fortunate, I got to fly the uh, SU-27 on a, just, just an exchange flight when we were over in Moscow. And I, I was so amazed that A, it was a big airplane, right? Felt more like an F-14, but yeah. it was so predictable. You know, we did the tail slide, right? Yeah. And I remember watching uh, the, the pilot and I said, you know, let's do one. And he did one and I said, I got it, I got it. And he's like, really? I was like, yeah. And you, you just pulled the nose up to about 80 degrees. I can't remember exactly, but, um, and then, you know, pull the throttles back. And as, as it started to slide, full back stick right and then but what was so amazing to me was how honest that airplane was there was no doubt in my mind it was just going to drop you know it wasn't going to do a, a falling leaf it was going to drop and then the key there was don't come back on the throttles too quick get some airspeed going and then pull up the throttles but it was so honest of an airplane um did you get to test any of the russian airplanes besides the mig-15 no, you know, and the, the old concept peg, I flew against some of them, but uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so that airplane you flew, is that all electronic flight controls, computerized? I don't remember. It was 1992, yeah. and it was at Kabinka Air Base. Uh, I don't remember. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Well, that's, I mean, that's what we were trying to find in the Hornet by modifying entry conditions for departure and see if we could predict departure recovery and and you can't we, we yeah. couldn't do that and then that would get into the discussion of what's your external configuration you know yeah. the airplane's great design the way it was right clean wings aim nines drag a zero go for it right and what do we do we throw pylons on it we throw pylons on it in fact uh, gary evans who i think is still working enf gary was a navy reserve diver he was the lead engineer in Canada Ver. There's an oxymoron for you, right? <laughs> we have the vertical ejector rack. So in lieu of that, McDonnell Douglas had made a lot of them and said, hey, Navy, these are easy. And what they did was they put a spacer in and canned it out five and a half degrees. 
But now we get these rack dynamics. But anyway, I had to go to ordnance team and uh, Gary taught me a lot about mines. That's why I was the captor project officer, the quick strike project officer, you know, things like that. And we won the inaugural Stephen Hazelrig Award, which the Colonel just went up to space, you know, with uh, that crowd that was on his resume. Much like your interception was on ah, your I'm glad you brought that up. I <laughs> see the OU behind you. And I love the picture you showed me with your bow tie of uh, Ohio State. So the yeah, Ohio that was, State. Yeah, that was with, uh, my picture is Neil Armstrong. Yeah, Neil Armstrong. That was in February. That was the 50th anniversary of Americans in space. And um, wow. he passed away, I think, three months after that, just by going in for some. But yeah, I, I have a signed certificate of him years ago on the, from the moon because he was kind of a reckless. And the interesting thing was there were people where he was a professor, had no idea what he had done. Really? Yep. You know, I was, oh. was, what was the essence of, by the way, I'm looking at the picture right now and, you know, he's shaking your wife's hand and uh, you got this beautiful look. That, what, what did you take away from that meeting? Uh, he's a very humble man. Uh, you know, people always ask, I remember John Glenn, uh, he was on stage one time and um, this was that same, that, this was that, that same anniversary, right? So John Glenn and Mrs. Glenn are on stage and they redid the whole thing like they had done with the Apollo recoveries and all that. Um, it was just an amazing night there in Columbus. Uh, but there was this young um, journalism co-ed and she did a great job. She was up on stage with, uh, you call him, I call him Colonel Glenn. He always had, you look at him in a coat and a tie, he always has a Marine Corps officer tie clasp on, okay? And um, I got a couple of books signed by him, but this young lady, I don't know her name, she did a great job between uh, Senator Glenn, Colonel Glenn, and Mrs. Glenn. And um, mm. so she once asked him about heroes, she said, do you have any heroes? He goes, no, I've never believed in heroes. I don't believe I'm a hero. He said, um, you perform and you do the best you can with God-given ability and you just continue, you know, to, I, he didn't say meet the challenge, but I kind of took that away too, because that was what I, you know, you got, you're glad to be here. To me, it's always meet the challenge and you, you decide what opportunity gets you the next challenge. So she said, do you have any heroes? And he answered that just like I said, but he said, I will tell you one thing. Um, there's one man in the world I do envy and looked and pointed at um, Neil, uh, Neil Armstrong. He said, you know, I envy you, Neil. So even John Glenn, right, as much as, you know, he accomplished, it was, and I think that was the competitive aspect because if you go back to, um, I was at Pax River 91, right? So that's the 30th anniversary. Um, another astronaut, Mike Foreman, who was a Navy P-3 pilot and a 1979 graduate of the Naval Academy, um, he, him and I were in class together. We went from Pax River, we came up to D.C. in the uh, Hilton, and this was the 20th anniversary of American in Space. And what's, you know, Deanna is a, is a very aggressive, she reads a lot, right? And I used to I read her, Donna would read her, grandkids are the same way, but I was always like to go to cut out bookstores, right? These old bookstores. So I'd find a book, We Seven, you know, the story of the first astronauts. Oh, and, nice. uh, I get it for like a buck 25 at St. Mary's County because we're going to this thing. So I'm in dress blues. Mike's in his uh, lieutenant commander, uh, you know, even dress. And the wives, we, we drive up there. I get out, Captain, you know, I'm going, I'm not carrying this book. So I see some kid get out of a car who's probably about 10, and he's got a tuxedo on, and he's got the book. I got to go back and get the book. So I go back and get my book. We sit with uh, John Luke Picard and Star Trek The Next Generation, and, you know, we're all want to be astronauts, right? Mike ended up being an astronaut. Scotty Altman ended up being an astronaut of our class, Tomcat guy. So by the end of the night, you know, everybody's walking around. I got this book. So I get everybody but Mr. Grissom signs it because he's passed. You know, he was killed in that fire. And um, 
Admiral Shepard was really tired. I can remember that. And he had a long night and family. And um, but I got everybody to sign it. So I'm standing there in the end with uh, Bill Dana, you know, Jose Jimenez, the eighth astronaut. And you got to go back and watch, um, you know, Ed Sullivan on Sunday night. You'll know who Bill Dana is. But really? He's a comedian. Yeah. So, but he was the eighth astronaut, quote unquote. It was more along the lines of, so he looks at me, he goes, Captain, he says, you want me to sign your book? He's got kind of this panic accent, you know, and I said, yes, sir, if you don't mind. He said, let me ask. You. He said, do uh, you know who Werner Von Braun is? I said, he's from the test pilot, Pax River. Yes, I know who Werner Von Braun is. He goes, look him up in your book. So I look him up, he goes, how many, how many entries? And I tell him, he goes, you know, look up Jose Jimenez, Bill Dana. He goes, how many entries? And it's like five more than Werner Von Braun. Because that's my advice to you, kid, go into comedy. And he signs the book. So, I mean, I got that, you know, where I've got them off of that's, that's, uh, you know, 1991. Whoa, whoa. Hey, what, um, Smash, so what was your call sign before Smash? And did you get your call sign because of the ejection or did you already uh, have I got my call sign at, at my winging. Oh. Because at that point it was just Euro or whatever, you know, when, yeah. Um, um, but the one guy, you know, I'll, I'll read white uh, is here, you know, he's down in Atlanta. Um, it's funny in nine months in Beeville, I see those people more than anybody because really how we, um, I caught up to these guys, right? It just because of the pro process flow. So yeah. BT24, I'm sorry, BT26, BT25. So Jeff Blaylock and I got our wings together. I caught up with him. He was my best man at my wedding. He lives about four miles from here. Uh, Reed White's down in Atlanta. Um, he got his wings in July. I got my, I think it was July. And mine are in September. Pat Gregoire was there. Pat and I met each other in 76 at OCS. He was kind of with Reed. So there were four of us. Um, and I was the last guy into that. You know, and it was always... You know, if, if you're good, you don't have to tell anybody, they'll know, all right? And we always try to fly the perfect flight, you know? And then we would critique each other in the BOQs, right? And go, How nice. you, well, you bonehead, you did this, you did this. So it was a tough crowd to grow into. And even scoundrel, Bill Blaylock, to this day, he looks, he goes, the first time I met her, I go, this guy's a dickhead. <laughs> and I looked at him and said the same thing. You know, we've been tight ever, but you get to the call sign, so, I used to eat pretty fast. Still kind of do. I got to slow down because of. So anyway, Reed made the comment once we had gone out. And, um, he basically smashed his food. And that was just a passing comment. All right. And that was also Pat and I fought smokers in Bevo until Smoke Burgess, the senior Marine, says, you guys got to stop this because I got a lot of money in you and you're beating <laughs> up on these sailors. You know, so cut it out. So, you know, it's amazing what a direct order will accomplish in the Marine Corps. So anyway, when I get my wings, the last flight, which I think I might have sent one of those pictures, Smoke's got the name tag, First Lieutenant Smash Urvich. And there you go. Oh, he did. That's where, I, that's the first time I got it. So now it's funny, you know, like at the school, I'm the oldest flight instructor. And, you know, when Deanna wants something, it'll be, Hey, Daddy, but typically you get my attention, she'll go, hey, smash. So, oh, know, yeah. And I said, you know, the funny thing, it's on my shirts, it's on my tags on my cars. And I said, the point now is, you know, as you get older, that's why that's why old people have names on their shirts at the schools. Because we got to re remember as we get older, we got to know who we were, you know, in case ah. I told Deanna, I said, if I'm sitting in a corner blowing bubbles, just put in a Hornet CD or a Phantom CD and I'll be fine, you know. So you got it. You put your name on everything, so you know who you were when you start losing your mind. Hey, tell me uh, two questions, and then I, I want to get some of your life lessons. But the the first question I I still uh, have is the Ohio State. You you tell me the why are you such a strong Ohio State fan? I mean, I can feel it. And by the way, I think you read I was the last one to intercept Art. No, that was that. Deanna showed me that. Yeah, he just got out of prison too. I was, exactly. there when he was, I was there when he was there. I, I won't go into him because I got really nothing 
a value to add, you know, so that's why I said I was happy to read that. But, um, so, you know, I, I played, uh, I played the, the, at the time, the highest uh, high school level football in Ohio. Okay. And uh, in fact, my little brother, Danny, did a whole lot better because he went to the Naval Academy to play football. And I don't know what happened, but he was uh, all yeah. Ohio defensive player of the year. And that, and he spent about 12 years in the Marine Corps. But so I believed all that stuff about my high school football coaches. You know, it's not the size of the dog in the fight. It's the size of the fight in the dog. So um, I went down there and I, I put my paper in a walk on. Great. They never called me. So I figured they lost it. So I did it again. Never got called. Looked at the baseball program. They had 625 kids for one walk on spot playing baseball. Now, the biggest place in Ohio that offered me a baseball was Ohio University. Um, I had some, you know, a booster I wanted to look at, Oberlin, things like that. I just, you know, I, I knew I wanted to go to Columbus. But um, a few years later, because I was a security guard and I just got out of OCS in 76. So it's fall of 76. And there's an issue in the dorms. And um, I also worked in a real department. So I ended up running into Coach Hayes in the dorm. And I, you know, I had a Marine haircut that was just growing out in Quantico, right? And, you know, <laughs> he was a big historian, military historian. So he says, uh, he says, young man, I like your haircut. So thanks, coach. And uh, I proceeded to tell him that, you know, I said, hey, I walked on and this and this. And he said, so what are you going to do when you graduate from Ohio State? And I said, I'm going to go to Marine Corps and be a fighter pilot. He goes, that's good because you had no future playing football here at Ohio State. <laughs> and I ran, I had like four, four interactions because I worked in the Aaron Mill department and he used to come over and then. You know, my senior year was when uh, he he punched out that Clemson linebacker. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you know, the people who took care of him were the military. He got an office in Converse Hall. And, um, oh, good. I've since gone to his hometown, put some money, Don and I, and um, to the memorial there. So we're on the plaque um, right below the Herb Streets. So we won't go there either. But, oh, really? Yeah, they were on there. and. You know, and, and I, I had won an alumni award in 91, the William Oxley Thompson Award um, for professional achievement before 35. Wow. So, you know, I got to go back to a lot of those. And it was funny, they used to do uh, congression. They probably still do. I just don't go to Ohio State. Those congressional bref breakfasts here downtown. And the one year since I was supposed to be the senior military guy, they, they asked me if I'd do the the uh, Pledge of Allegiance. So we sat at the head table with Gordon Gee and uh, one of the Congresswomen from Cleveland and Archie was sitting next to me and uh, Andy Gerd. So, you know, Archie stands up and it's, uh, God bless him, he's a great man. Good for the university and, you know, he said, um, you know, gets up, OH, blah, blah, here we are, this is what we're doing. He says, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Colonel Doug Yurovich, you know, William Oxley Top, Thompson Award winner. Um, he's got more awards that I got time up here. So I'm just going to ask him to come up and lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. So I did, you know, and then at the break, you know, it was Senator Portman and a couple of the other Ohio State ROTC guys going, Smash, that was pretty good. You didn't even need a cue card. <laughs> Yeah, I was wondering if you remembered the words or not. We used to joke around. With we do that. Women. I do that to do that once a month with uh, the MOA because that's how we start the Mon Burton MOA meeting is with the Pledge of Allegiance. Hey, I want to um, I want to talk about the culture between the Marines and the Navy. Uh, you've got to experience both. How do you define what's similar and what's different? Um. I'll, I'll give you a vignette from, I get called into the director's office at Pax River and um, the F-18 shop is not going well. Okay, we're having flight line issues. We're having other issues. So he goes, I need you to go down there and fix it. Said, okay, sir, I'll go down and fix it. Now, <clears throat> I had more than one blue jacket manual that I had read 
and then ended up signing it and gave it to sailors who I thought. Um, remember who I said was the finest naval officer I ever served for. So I'm not gonna, you know, but on the other hand, what ends up happening is I go down there and, you know, I, I flew the airplane, I, I knew the, and what I found was there was just no top cover for some people who wanted to be professional. I won't say squared away because now you get into the jargon between the two cultures of the service, but I'd say squared away. So I basically went down there and said, look, we're gonna have a uniform inspection on Friday. I'm gonna inspect, okay? Um, if you're in the front gate and you look like a chocolate mess, I'm gonna relieve you and stand the duty till I can get a supernumerary. You better know your 11 general orders, okay? We gotta tighten up the ship here a little bit because one of the things is the Navy at sea is as professional as anybody, okay? You see what we do, they do around carriers and all that. But, you know, you heard this in Lemoor, I did as an instructor, you hear it at other places, well, this is short duty, okay? Now, in the enlisted ranks there, what I found was, and it, it changed in a week. And what I found was after the uniform inspection, someone was paying attention again, right? I didn't have to do anything. I had a senior chief, she's a female, all right? Um, two first class petty officers who had not not been picked for chief yet. And that's a whole different dynamic in the, you're not a chief, but you're still first class petty officer and really pretty solid. And then a couple second class petty officers. And all they were looking at was for top cover to score it away because the chatter in the dugout down there was, ah, you guys just want to be like Marines, you know, squared away in the whole bit instead of just being professional on shore duty, okay? So I get out to sea and I would, in every deployment, look at a subset of a ship and kind of pay attention to them. When I was a DCAG, I worked the Bowcats, okay? I worked in a steel mill growing up. I mean, I got through um, college doing industrial sewage in the, in the steel mill in uh, Lorraine, Cuyahoga. It was a dirty job before it was a dirty job. Um, oh. I knew lockout procedures. I knew a lot of other stuff. So I was with the Bobcat guys, you know, the green shirts up there. And I'd pay attention after five walk, I'd come back. And I said, let me know what you're doing. How you doing? What are you doing? So how do you lock this out? This is this or this. Because I knew the big XO who just retired as the air boss, right? D. Wolf Miller, bullet. Oh, and, yeah. Yeah. He was, um, both of our daughter, both of our kids went to PVI here. And D. Wolf's an 81 graduate of the Naval Academy. So um, he was the big XO on the Carl Vinson. And I was a DK. So I talked to him, I told him what I was doing. And then I talked to the, the Divo and then the leading chief petty officer. And there was a lot of mentoring going through that. I'd help him out there. You know, I'd go out and, and try to do what I could, you know, um, talk about safety, talk about lockout, let them know someone's paying attention, you know. And in the end, I gave out um, some medals. I gave up my personal coin that I had as the Marine DKK. And um, those kids uh, would come talk to me when they thought they were in the world of shit. Now, mm -hmm. the funny thing I used to do because I was kind of an enigma for a while. We were in San Diego, the Vincent was there, right? And we were doing a lot of force protection exercises back then, metal detectors and all of that. So, I jumped in to the E3 and below line to get on the ship. Since the very close, two and a half hours. Wow. Okay. I finally get close enough where the master at arms, <laughs> so, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm standing behind these one guy and gal. They got purple hair on, the wigs, the shit face, you know, and they go, What do you do? I go, I work in the air. And, um, you know, really, yeah, what do you do, dude? I said, I, I work in the air wing, you know, and it's just, I'm not ship's company. So I get close enough to the pier and uh, 
Tents are not deck, you know, DK arriving, tents are not ah. here. So I'm, my cover's blown, right? So ah. I hear, I walk around and all I hear is, who the hell was that guy? <laughs> so, you know, the next day, we start to get all these uh, sailors in the E3 and below line um, run up for XOI or they didn't make, you know, they didn't make the ship and all that. And I want to talk to Bullet. I said, Bullet, this is on set. I mean, I stood in that line for two and a half hours. Couldn't get through security because of the metal detectors, you know? And I I talked to the big XO and then I talked to the CAG and I just said, this is not right for these kids that we can't, you want to talk about a force protection issue? You got two and a half hour line there trying to get people on the ship. That's a target. So, you know, when they, when they know that they did right according to what they're telling you, and then what you're going to do is hammer them, they don't have real confidence in the system that somebody's looking out for them because they work their butts off, you know, on the flight deck. They're grease monkeys. They look, you know, you look 18 hours. You, you've been out there. You know what I'm talking about. And I'm not telling you that there's not good leadership because there is, but a lot of those kids feel like they get chewed up in that system and nobody's mm -hmm. looking out for them. And again, I can't change the world. I can't, right. the Marine Corps is a ground combat centric organization. Naval aviation and the way the Navy looks at between black shoes, brown shoes, the guys that got to get pinged for a living that go downstairs and hide, you know, in the water space management program. Those are three independent entities. Mm -hmm. So there's a culture in each one of those that encompasses big Navy. You yeah. know, all of us in the Marine Corps um, were trained by drill instructors. You know, we put rounds on target from the 500 yard line. And I had two aviation appreciation tours as a FAC and 1st Battalion, 8th Marines and 3rd wow. Battalion, 4th Marines. So, you know, it's the, the culture comes from, um, and your part in your book, it comes from the roots of the organization. And you're not going to change that whole culture. And I, I think it was, it, it might have been Randy Robb, but, I, you know, it's the whole, you take command, somebody gives you the flag, it's like grabbing a Nerf ball. You can hold it, you can squeeze it, you can release it, but when I give it to you, it's going to change form. And that's what happens in an organization. So, you know, your idea is um, the sphere of influence to me is important for a commander for a short period of time. Because no matter what you do, and no matter how many people you talk to, there's a sphere of influence of those people who take what you said and they yep. will continue to run, you know, to take care of that, that it maintains momentum. You know, and that's what you're trying to do with organizations and reading some of the leadership in your book that said. So if you if you go, you know, the, the woe is me program, I can't change the world, so I'm not going to do anything. You've just given up. Yeah, Again, exactly. face, face the challenge. Yeah. Well, I love that mantra of yours. In fact, uh, let's wrap up with two, two thoughts. I could keep talking forever, uh, but I want to get the people uh, some wisdom from you. So what are, what are some of your takeaways on life that you learned, whether it's in aviation or from your dad, and mom, it doesn't matter to me. What were some of your, your life lessons, live withs that you want to share with the audience right now? Well, I kind of alluded to them. Sorry about the time. But, no, no, it's good. Um, I, I still believe if you work hard and put efforts into it, um, you can be successful. You know, you look at your own experience. You wanted to go to Hornets. You ended up going to A7s, okay? All right? Setback. For many, type A personality, not many, a few, type A personalities would have taken that personally and probably said, that's it. I don't, I wouldn't agree with that, but, right. you know, okay. um, the Harrier program. Um, I hit that place on the top of the world and I left it um, 
you know, I will tell you when I transferred out of 203 or was transferred, I went to what was called a hands unit, 32. Oh yeah. Okay. Yep. Flew away Fort Mike. So I got a lot of time away from Fort Mike. Oh, nice. The CO was a guy named Blue Chip Ashworth and the XO was Hook Reed. This is 1982. So you think Lieutenant Colonel with 20 years plus, 82, do the math, Vietnam guys, right? So I report as First Lieutenant Yurovich and, and the skipper says, I'll bet you your, your morale's down upon your ankles. He said, I can only ask you to do one thing and that's be a Lieutenant of Marines. Yes, sir, I got that. I am reasonably sure that the time I spent in hams gave me the opportunity to go fly a fan because people saw how you reacted to adversity and failure, okay? <laughs> I tell people this now, they, they will look at the resume. They will, I've done a lot of career days. Um, I'll be back to Ohio State to talk to ROTC units. Um, somebody will say, you know, man, you've been very successful. Look at your resume. You've done all this stuff. Um, how do you, what do you attribute your successes to? I go, my failures. Oh, nice. Okay. Because I know you play football, you, you, you know, if you play baseball, you know what the Mendoza line is, right? That oh, yeah. 200, yeah. So I said, if you look, uh, I mean, I failed in this, I failed in that. It took me three Turks looks to get to be a test pilot. I was 0 for 2 in the astronaut program. I never made the mag command, um, you know. So you start adding it up, I'm kind of around the Mendoza line because nobody goes through life undefeated. Right. And you're going to face adversity. And you're going to have a challenge. And how do you handle that challenge? Uh, whether you fold the tent or, like I say, you get up with a strong backbone and lace up the boots tight, knowing everybody's looking at you going there because they're still evaluating you. There's yep. formal evaluations and informal evaluation. And you got to, you just got to tighten up your belt and tighten up your boots and get back to it if you want to do that. And I read, when I read through yours, I, there's some of that that you did. Okay, because you had this focus on what you wanted to do, but you didn't get it right away. And a lot of people who don't get it right away now, because we are so much into the information age and I should have yeah. it, you know, you owe it to me, that type of thing. No one owes you anything. You go in and work and do what you need to do. And if you don't seek self-improvement, right, and be honest with yourself that you need to get better, um, Yeah, you're going to stagnate and then you're going to blame everybody because everybody's holding me back because you have no work ethic or the ability to recover. Yeah, so I mean, with, with what you're doing now, uh, how are you giving back to the world? What is it that's meaningful in your life now? Well, I mean, the best part is my, my daughter, my grandson, my granddaughter, and, and my son-in-law, the family. But um, just because of who they've come, become, I'm, I'm real proud of all of them. Um, my wife's solid. She got strong fast. Um, <clears throat> I was in the Marine Corps seven years when she met me, and that's another whole story. But, um, you know, I'm the president of the MOA uh, to help veterans. Um, I wrote the test pod course and I get people calling me and this one guy calls me from South Carolina. He's a retired colonel in the Air Force flew big wings. We, we were going through the same type of discussion, you know, because he was interested in the test pod course that I, uh, I wrote. And he goes, you know what it sounds like to me? And I said, no, what? He goes, he says, you are failing retirement miserably. So <laughs> I got that going for me, you know? But um, <laughs> I think, the MOA's kind of a piece. I was on the advisory board for the Department of Mathematics for the last five and a half years as the yeah. alternate chair. Uh, we got that started. That's been very successful. But some of the agenda items now, I just don't have the desire to get involved with. So I resign. You know, I might consider the national MOA board that they're opening up in January. But the giving back is, is the mentoring. I mean, it's funny. Yeah. A lot of the people who used to live in this neighborhood, now their kids are growing up. And I've tutored a lot of them in mathematics. 
And a lot of times the parents text Deanna or Donna and say, hey, you know, can Smash help so-and-so, you know? And it's usually a 911 texting because they're gonna yeah. have a quiz or they just had a quiz. So I've had really good success with those, you know, and, um, but, but we trained 16 year olds out to 78 year olds at the airport teaching to fly. And it's awesome. Um, that's the cool thing watching some of these people finally get it and, yeah. um, and teaching that because the lessons learned in 41 years of aviation, um, well, they'd like to say that, um, you know, that's where they'd like to be. We want to give them the skill set so they can be there. Um, so wow. that's the point yeah. of giving back. You pay forward, you know, again, I, how many people that I mentioned through this thing that off the top of my head through the discussion, because they yeah. are readily apparent, readily apparent to me all the time of why I'm here. Lieutenant Camp, Commander Crisp, you know, Scoundrel, Reed White, Pat Gregoire, who passed in a G-Lock incident, uh, Smoke Burgess, um, Wizard Pennington. Yeah. Wow, powerful names. So, yeah. uh, and Smash, they have a powerful oh, impact. Yes, that impact. Yeah. I I, uh, I want to leave with our last question, and it's it's about the glad to be here. You know, you read the book. Uh, you know what glad to be here means on the blues. What does yeah. glad to be here mean to you? How do you take that phrase? Well, <laughs> if there's a couple of ways to take it. I mean, I read your book and I have your focus, but uh, when I saw the cup and I opened up the box, first off, that's not what I thought. So um, what'd you think initially? Well, I am glad to be here because I could have been dead six times. Exactly. Okay, that's, that's number one. You know, it's always funny as you get older, um, you know, we meet people that we knew in the service or whatever, and you go, hey, how you been? Good to see you. And the standard line is it's always good to be seen, right? So, <laughs> um, but that's kind of the, that's kind of the key. There are, there's a lot more to the psychology of living through what we live through. And, um, you know, it's, I think I sent that one picture with, uh, I think it's a 146 airplane or 147 airplane right off the deck. Yeah. You know, and I always tell people, if you're not living on the edge, you're taking up too much room. But a lot <laughs> of people don't like to get near the edge, right? So, uh, <laughs> um, you know, I almost ran a Phantom into the water on a single engine um, during an eval, ACT eval. And that's another story with my Rio, who's an 80 graduate in the Naval Academy. I was at 40, 482 in the Pentagon during the impact and helped people get out of there. He missed me by about two windows. I think I sent you that picture. Um, yeah. I got blown on my back. I flew O2s for two years out in Lamore. Oh, did you? Yeah, Bull Shut taught me how to fly a duck. T t remember Tom Vaughn up in uh, Fallon? Oh, yeah. Yeah, TV was the OIC up there. So I was going through to Hatchby to get to Yuma, and there was a Willy Willy out in San Clemente. I had two maintenance guys, a captain and gunny. I got blown on my back at the Hatchapi and I was IFR, you know, in the duck and I just pulled everything back and kind of did a split S coming out. Said, holy, cause I had no, I, I knew where the mountains were but I couldn't see them. I got it back up and I pointed back to Lemoore and LA center in November, Julie 595 declared an emergency. I'm going back to Lemoore, you know, and um, so you go through those times, right? And the ejection was just another, you know, that was just more right in your face paramount type of thing. There was a night of 30, I think I sent the PEM too, the uh, Thunder One, you know, you go through 30 November 99 and, um, you know, but then even as the DKEG, we had two of the snakes run into each other in a thunderstorm over Baghdad and lost both of them. So, you know, we had a guy, uh, when I was the exo, tried to move a mountain and fell, right? Um, you talk about lessons learned with dealing with that and my squadron, if you remember Viegas, you know, one of my, one of my pilots bombed Viegas and killed that guy. Oh, right? yeah. So the, the feedback years later was I met them. I was in the six pack and I heard guard erupt and I got called upstairs, shut down. 
and they they weren't going to let them fly out, of course. But um, they brought them out in a helicopter. I met them on the flight line. And the one guy now, the flight leads the Brigadier General and Marine Corps, and rightly so, because the uh, Dash Two sat for nine year nine months, and then I think he retired as a lieutenant colonel. But um, you know, they they told me a while back after that. You know, I went up and talked to them and said, "How are you guys doing?" Because they thought I was going to chew their ass. And I went down to the dispensary and just sat with them. You know, because I had been through the community leper program. Yeah. You know, I've been through the guys surviving the injection and no one can talk to you because of the MIR. And you have reps from the people who build the airplane pointing at you saying, you screwed it up, all right? And that goes back to my point of, if you're doing what you're supposed to be doing, NATOPS, and you're not cutting corners, if something happens, they never did find my knee board, but if you could picture a guy on a back brace with everything cut off of them, no chin, a neck brace in an air cast, and they asked me for my statement. And I write my statement and I write the FCS displays out with the X's and the cautions. They dismissed it because of the situation I was in. It went in as evidence, of course. But, you know, the funny thing, I was a lieutenant commander who was supposed to press on my stomach and um, see that I wasn't bleeding to death, and they took two hours to find him Jim. and they took my blood and the guys, he goes, are you going to find any, am I going to find anything? I said, yeah, you're going to find aspirin. He goes, why do you take aspirin? I said, the orthos told me to take aspirin for years. I said, when I was 15 years old in the Cleveland clinic, the doc, after, after you operated my, he gave me a bottle of aspirin, 300, so to have this done in a month, you do the gazintas, right? So the guy comes back with the blood, my wife's there by now. He goes, well, we did find the aspirin. He says, you know, but uh, your cholesterol is kind of high. And my wife, who had been in orthos, yeah, she looks at him and says, isn't cholesterol related, and related to stress? And he goes, well, yes, it is. And she goes, don't you think he's been under stress? <laughs> so I never saw that guy again. But, uh, you know, that, again, they're, the challenge there is to recover from that. So yeah. here you are one October, the MIR keeps working and keeps working and working. And I would say the names of those guys and give them credit. But to this day, I owe them the fact that I still got to fly. Yeah. Because they went through every bit of information and they printed them out, went through them. And somebody saw the FCS display and said, where have we seen this? And they go, Smash, put, Smash did this in the ER. On the back. Wow. And they put it up and it matched. So, what went from statistically insignificant became a review of those lot airplanes where some of the Navy's airplanes had left the deck and shot off and rolled right in the water. Not many, but enough to now make it somewhat significant. So, you know, if you live through that, I'm glad to be here. Um, yeah. You look at the organizations depending, the organization can chew you up a bit and there's got to be somebody in a sphere of influence that's gonna take care of, for justice sake, what's happening. And you have to have faith that that's gonna happen. And yeah. somebody did it for me along a variety of levels. And uh, I tried to do it for those people back because somebody took care of me. And, um, Otherwise, I was, I thought about teaching math at East Carolina in 1982. <laughs> I didn't know I was going to get the fly. And the next thing you know, now I got all the patches and I'm a Marine CAG. You know, who'd have thunk it? Who'd have thunk? I mean, I, again, I, I want to thank you. I, I'm going to end with the glad to be here, uh, to have this conversation, to learn so much from your experiences and, and to refresh some of the names. You know, it, it yeah. really brought back some joy. Uh, but to, to, again, to talk to someone who's had your career uh, and, and to end as the, are you been the only Colonel Navy captain? Yeah, if you look, Taylor Hook did a nice uh, history of that. Um, I think after my selection in 02 or 03, and, and I still have it downstairs, there were two other Marines who were Air Wing commanders before the CAG system and I think CWC. Um, okay. Because the senior sailor on board either didn't come back um, 
or um, something happened. Um, yeah. I think there was one in Korea and one in Vietnam, if I remember the article. But to say that the leadership of both services put together a board of generals and admirals to pick someone on purpose to do this, uh, that this was it. So Taylor did a nice piece. And I want to say it was, um, it had to be the winner of um, probably 03 or near when I was going to take, take the air wing. Wow. Well, thank you, Smash. Thanks for uh, this conversation. Uh, truly uh, excited about this. So glad to be here. Thank you, brother. Glad to be here. Thanks, uh, Gucci. I appreciate it. And um, thanks, Sugar, for all his help, too.